right, we'll get started, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this talk sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs, and 18 certificates of graduate study. If you're interested in learning more about us, please feel welcome to visit us at iwp.edu. Also, to support the work of IWP, please visit iwp.edu forward slash donate. Today, we'll be hearing from Mrs. Diana West, who will deliver a lecture entitled The Real Secrets of the Archives, Reconsidering the Research of Vladimir Bukowski and Herb Romerstein. This event is part of the Herb Romerstein Memorial Lecture on Propaganda and Deception in collaboration with our Intermerium Lecture Series. Diana West is an award-winning journalist and the author of The Red Thread, A Search for Ideological Drivers Inside the Anti-Trump Conspiracy, published in the 2019 issue of the Center for Security Policy Press. A journalist since graduating from Yale, West began writing a weekly newspaper column at the Washington Times, where she also wrote editorials under editorial page editors Hell Dale and the late Tony Blankley. The column would be nationally syndicated for 15 years. A collection of West's columns came out under the title No Fear, Selected Columns from America's Most Politically Incorrect Col Columnist in the Brevera Books. West is also one of 19 co-authors of Sharia, The Threat to America, a publication of the Center for Security Policy. With that, please welcome Mrs. Diana West. Thank you very much. I am very honored to be giving the Herb Romerstein Annual Lecture. And speaking also of Vladimir Bukovsky, whom I'll be discussing as well, I'd like to mention the perhaps fateful happenstance that today, October 27th, is the anniversary of Bukovsky's death in 2019. I want to start by revealing a very early plan for what's now being called the Great Reset. In this plan, which is nearly 100 years old, America is to become just another region in a unified, organized world. The economic system of that unified world will be one great organization. Science also will be organized and work according to plan, backed by the full power of the government. God will be banished from the laboratories as well as from the schools and about the schools to quote, to further the cultural revolution, the schools, colleges, and universities will be coordinated and grouped under a national department of education and its state and local branches. The studies will be cleansed of religious, patriotic, and other features of the bourgeois ideology. The students will be taught on the basis of Marxian dialectical materialism, internationalism, and the general ethics of the new socialist society. These wicked dreams coming true are contained in the 1932 book called Toward Soviet America. It was written by the Communist Party chairman of the US Communist Party at the time, William Foster. And we hear the clunky language of materialism and bourgeois ideology, but I think we also hear that the agenda blends into what we are now calling globalism. Here's another crude iteration of early globalism from another US Communist Party chief, Earl Browder, writing in 1936. The property rights of the capitalists and the institutions by which they are maintained must be abolished. Today, the World Economic Forum puts a smiley face on it and says, by 2020, you will own nothing and be happy. Is this what the end of the long march through the institutions looks like? Was this road to liberty's doom inevitable? After all, free people reject electronic surveillance and digital tracking and forced medical interventions and other forms of state repression and torture. Or do they? Are you and your loved ones vaxxed and boosted because someone ordered you? Have you said a word about the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of vaccine-related injuries and deaths? Do you have a smartphone? Rosa Corey, who early, very early, identified the tentacles of Agenda 21, told us that the acronym SMART stands for sustainability, monitoring, assessing, rating, and tracking. Maybe once we would have rejected the postmodern leg irons of servitude before the long march had gotten very far. Maybe we would not have accepted the 2020 cancellation of our Bill of Rights in the top-down revolution, to borrow Dr. Jack Ziak's phrase, executed by leaders of democratic governments against their own peoples. This was a brand new kind of world war making, revolutionaries at the top 
seizing power from we the peoples. And it was unprecedented for its worldwide scope and synchronicity. Or maybe I'm mistaken. That was something called COVID that triggered something called lockdown that created the opportunity for something called the Great Reset. As an experiment today, let's try thinking about such things under the old heading of convergence, that long sought, long planned union between what earlier generations called communism and the free world. Communism, if you remember, was supposed to get a human face, while the free world, I suppose, would get a communist heart. In other words, this was always a grand plan for the extinction of God-given liberty. Blended, the two systems, freedom and servitude, would form the hybrid, as Vladimir Bukowski put it, of a kindergarten and a labor camp. Thinking of happy face health services forcing poison shots into men, women, and children for the collective good, according to the party line, this image looks a lot like reality. Whitaker Chambers told us something about these matters a long time ago. Chambers was an American Soviet intelligent agent, intelligence agent who defected and wrote, a, wrote about his life before and after his break with communism in his famous 1952 memoir, Witness. In the quotation I'm about to read, he's trying to explain the intensity of the rage he aroused among, let's call them the proto-globalists of the day for telling the American people the truth about his life inside the American underground before World War II. This would be in the 1930s. It was a life deeply intertwined with men inside the US government, the types who would definitely flock to Davos today. In reality, they were communist agents under control of Stalin's Kremlin. We know that because Chambers was their KGB go-between and for other reasons as well. Chambers' network of spies and agents of influence famously included the State Department official Alger Hiss. Chambers wrote, what I hit was the forces of that great socialist revolution, which in the name of liberalism, spasmodically, incompletely, somewhat formlessly, but always in the same direction, has been inching its ice cap over the nation for two decades. It was the forces of that revolution that I struck at the point of its struggle for power. The imagery of the ice cap inching over the nation now for nine decades is unforgettable, but think about his mention of his timing, his having struck at the point of the revolution struggle for power. Chambers famously believed that in breaking with communism, he had joined the losing side. In these are times of silent acquiescence to an election coup, political persecution of dissenters and heretofore unthinkable government control over our very bodies to the cellular level in a burgeoning biosecurity police state that has all but displaced America. It is alas easier to understand Chambers sense that the socialist victory over liberty was even then probably too far along to stop. A key piece of evidence attesting to the validity of Chambers concerns comes to us 40 years later. It is 1992 and Vladimir Bukovsky, international human rights hero, co-founder of the Soviet dissident movement, survivor of 12 years inside the gulag system, including labor camps and psychiatric hospitals, is back in Moscow. He is doing everything he can to see that communism is destroyed once and for all. He's trying to convince the new leader, Boris Yeltsin, to put the communist system on trial, on public trial, all of the Nuremberg trials at the end of World War II, and to invite such international eminences as historian Robert Conquest and others to conduct it. This trial of communism was vital, Bukowski believed, to snatching Western victory from defeat in the Cold War, which as he put it, was never very cold on the part of the Soviets and never much of a war on the part of the West. It was a totally lost war, he thought, if humanity's score with communism went not only unsettled, but unnoticed. Bukowski wrote, I spent a lot of time trying to persuade the Yeltsin government to conduct such a trial. Yeltsin finally said no. The reason he had to say no was the enormous pressure he felt from the West not to have such a trial, from the West. He continued, I've seen the cables he received from all over the world, mostly from Russian embassies, explaining that local politicians and governments were vehemently against any trials or disclosure of crimes or opening of archives. Finally, Yeltsin just gave in. 
I think this is one of the most important, if little noticed, revelations to come out of the post-Soviet period. What would explain this? Bukowski it continues, because of documents I recovered, we now know why the West was so against putting the communist system on trial. It is not only that the West was infiltrated by the Soviets much deeper than we ever thought, but also that there was ideological collaboration between left-wing parties in the West and the Soviet Union. This ideological collaboration ran very deep. So we're not just looking at infiltrators, spies from without, or appointed or directed from without, but collaboration from within. This was not Bukowski's first experience with the West's affinity with communism and socialism. From his earliest years in the West, after he was released from the Gulag in the mid 1970s, he met with the great foundations such as Ford and Rockefeller, journalists all over the world and the like, nearly all of whom he wrote were uninterested in what he had to say but rather attempted to readjust me to say what they wanted to hear. So he already knew about this, this pro-socialist bent of the Western establishment, but the breadth and depth of the ideological collaboration he was seeing in documents from archives he was able to get into, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, was something else again. Now, if these events of 30 years ago feel remote today, think about this, we've got some of the principal names in the news running around Moscow back then. In the last years of the Soviet era, so the late 1980s, we see Fiona Hill, a leading anti-Trump witness whose associate Igor Denchenko, the lowest hanging fruit of the Trump-Russia hoax was recently found innocent by a DC jury, surprise, surprise, of lying to the poor FBI. In the late 80s, Fiona Hill was finishing her studies at Maurice Thore Language Institute in Moscow, Maurice Thore was a particularly devoted Stalinist. Now she just missed the arrival of Nellie Orr, later of Fusion GPS and Steele Dossier fame, who in those last years of the USSR was studying the glories of forced collectivization. Then comes Christopher Steele, whose first assignment for British intelligence, fresh from his openly socialist days at Cambridge, is a post in Soviet Moscow. So th this is not that long ago when you think about where these people are today. Another event from this same time period, which I think it's more relevant today than ever, is the following. Fresh from the formal declaration of the end of the Cold War in February 1992, this was between Presidents Bush and Yeltsin, President Bush, George Bush, 41, goes to the Rio Earth Summit under the auspices of the United Nations to join scores of world leaders to sign on to the non, quote, non-binding soft law known as Agenda 21, a clear blueprint for the Great, Great Reset. This 1992 Earth, Earth Summit, by the way, was chaired by Maurice Strong, the man said to have invented global warming. Strong also helped start the World Economic Forum, and along with Henry Kissinger is said to have co-mentored Klaus Schwab, and who also worked with such lights as Mikhail Gorbachev and Stephen Rockefeller on power grabbing via radical environmentalism. Also, by the way, Natalie Raga Grant, who was the subject of last year's Romerstein lecture by Dr. Jack Siak, believed Gorbachev's post-Soviet climate activism was a continuation of his efforts to advance communism. It was a strange moment. The free world has just won the Cold War, the story goes, in a triumph of free people and free markets over cruel repression and central planning. And the Earth Senate Summit sets in motion new mechanisms for cruel repression and central planning. At this summit, which seems to have all but replaced our own constitutional convention, Maurice Strong declared, current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class involving high meat intake, use of fossil fuels, appliances, home and workplace air conditioning, and suburban housing are not sustainable. A shift is necessary, a great reset, which will require a vast strengthening of the multilateral system, including the United Nations. Sound familiar? Did I mention the World Health Organization is also a child of the UN? Unbowed, Vladimir Bukovsky goes on to write a history of his latest experiences in Moscow, along with his purloined Cold War documents. He was allowed to go into, Yeltsin gave him entree into the Central Committee uh, archives, and he was able over a extended period of time to extract numerous documents, which he made 
um, copies of unbeknownst to the library staff. He had a fancy scanner nobody was aware of, and he actually got them out of the country that way. And the book he wrote is called Judgment in Nuremberg. I'm sorry, <laughs> Judgment in Moscow, an echo of Judgment in Nuremberg, Soviet Crimes, Western Complicity. Just to give you the flavor it included, as he summed up, how the consensus of the Western establishment had accepted socialism as the inevitable future of the world and convergence with the Soviet system as the only alternative to the Cold War, how Western leaders developed their detente, remember detente, with the Soviets secretly, treacherously, through KGB channels as a means to achieve that convergence, which is, which is a concept that actually goes back at least as far as the Roosevelt administration, how all Western policy throughout the Cold War was aimed to preserve stability of the evil empire and not to achieve its destruction. In other words, the Bukowski archive is filled with surprises as far as our narrative goes. A couple that also kind of flip by and stand out to me, I think this is fascinating. He also found the text of the agreement that the first Soviet oligarchs signed with the Communist Party of the Soviet Union as to how they would get the right to dispose of par party property, although party property will always remain to party property. So in other words, the lands and resources of Russia, this appears to be the basis of the Russian oligarch system, which we're supposed to somehow believe happened in through magical capitalist genius and, and of course criminality. One document Bukowski saw listed, but was not actually allowed to see, it's also very tantalizing, it was a list of Western journalists on the KGB payroll. The reason he was given, they were still alive. Lo and behold, in 1995, Bukowski sells his book for a large advance to Random House. Before they sign on the dotted line, however, the head of the house, Jason Epstein, enters into a remarkable five-month dialogue via fax with Bukowski, alternately cajoling and hectoring the former dissident to rewrite the book from a left liberal perspective. Epstein wrote that he didn't want to puzzle or surprise American readers with Bukowski's puzzling and surprising discoveries and interpretations. So Bukowski, of course, should change them to fit the narrative, the party line, because these surprises were not allowed, apparently. Bukowski wrote, in short, I was required in no uncertain terms to drop some documents while reinterpreting others to show that, quoting Jason Epstein, the Soviets failed and their manipulation seems now in retrospect to have been pathetic or even comical. This is Epstein writing to Bukowski. That was clearly below my level of tolerance, Bukowski wrote. So politely but firmly, I explained to Mr. Epstein that due to certain peculiarities of my biography, I am allergic to political censorship. There's more to say about Jason Epstein who edited many of the famous writers of the day from Mailer to Doctorow. He also edited Saul Alinsky who had a very different experience with Epstein. In fact, in Alinsky's famous book, Rules for Radicals, Alinsky thanks Jason Epstein for his, quote, prodding patience and understanding and for being a beautiful editor. <sighs> ah. So after taking his manuscript away, Bukowski was unable to sell the book to any other US publisher. He similarly had trouble in Britain where he was a citizen, he became a British citizen. He says he finally found a Brit British publisher a small firm, family owned, and goes forward with this project. But the next thing we knew, Bukowski said in an interview in 2019, which actually was the year Judgment in Moscow was finally published in English, thanks to a group of top-notch volunteers. When they finally went ahead with this old contract in Britain, a team of lawyers is paying the publisher a visit and telling them, you try to publish this book and we will sue you into bankruptcy. It would be interesting to know who sent that team of lawyers. By the way, the book was published in Russia and France. There are no lawsuits against it. So what happens next to our Cold War history? Now, this is a very curious thing because what I'm about to tell you is something that has only occurred to me while working on this presentation. We're in the 1990s. The Cold War is formally declared over by the cold combatants themselves, Bush and Yeltsin, but there is to be no postmortem, no Nuremberg trial, not even Bukowski's book, at least not in the US and Britain. Instead, in the US and Britain, Cold War experts embark on a total rehash of Cold War events from the 1940s and 50s. 
Now I'm speaking in general terms, many exceptions may abound, but overall, the focus on secrets from the Soviet archives is very much confined to early days. No one seems to be clamoring for modern day secrets to be revealed, say from Brezhnev forward, the Kennedy assassination, what really happened when Bill Clinton went to Moscow in 1969-70, in the, the quote peace movement, the nuclear freeze, what about the POWs and MIAs left behind? What about detente, et cetera? The origins of the global warming movement. Rather, intelligence experts, writers, academics are somehow lured into restarting arguments that began and were largely settled half a century earlier. Was Alger Hiss guilty? Yes, he was still guilty. Were the Rosenbergs guilty? Yes, they were still guilty. Did we really have to do that all over again? Yes, if we didn't want any surprises. Now, I'm purposefully using a broad brush here. New and interesting items abound in these old archives. In fact, I wrote my book, American Betrayal, using these and other sources to revise and rewrite World War II and Cold War history by incorporating what it was that these agents and assets were actually able to do as infiltrators and ideological collaborators inside the US and other governments in this time frame. So too did Herbert Romerstein and co-author M. Stanton Evans in their book about the FDR years, Stalin's Secret Agents. Both of these books, by the way, are very surprising. But isn't it strange decades later to look back and see that as far as the state secrets paper trail goes, the Cold War between the superpowers seems to stop circa 1945 or 50, 55 at the latest. How did this happen? Who arranged the strange exercise in what I now see as narrative control? The answer is Russian and intel American intelligence services. After all, we must assume that everything coming out of intelligence archives is pre-sifted and censored by these same intelligence services, whether they are headquartered in Moscow or Washington. Take the much ballyhooed release of the Venona cables. Venona is the made up name of the archive of KGB cables copied by Western Union for the US government in the 1940s. In 1995, the year of Bukowski's book debacle, the NSA decided to release a very small fraction of these cables to very great acclaim and controversy. Now, when I say very small fraction, I mean tiny. 2,900 cables out of a reported one or even two million cables in the NSA archive. Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, whom we might call the human face of the NSA release, said there were, there were 100,000 cables in all. Even if his lowball estimate is correct, that means we are only getting two to 3% into the public domain. Many of these releases were only partly decrypted, as one historian put it, studded with hundreds of unbroken cryptonyms. Nonetheless, this, this Venona release is, we somehow remember it as this climactic event in the post-Cold War era of the opening, opening of Soviet archives, which didn't really open, even though this one was in Washington, DC. Venona in 1995 would be bookended by the 2009 release by the Wilson Center of the so-called Vasiliev Notebooks, another small batch of KGB documents originally copied by hand into eight notebooks in Moscow under KGB successor auspices by a former KGB officer named Alexander Vasiliev. It's worth noting that in his introduction to Spies, a book based on his notebooks, Vasiliev explains that he considers Stalin's secret agents such as Hiss and the rest of the 500 or so he and his co-authors tally up to be heroes. That's where he's coming from. Conversely, defectors are traitors. He makes it quite clear he would never spill the beans on an agent still living. Vasiliev clearly was not interested in being a source of surprises. So from Venona as curated by the NSA to Vasiliev as curated by the KGB successors, the Cold War of the intelligence services is suddenly reduced to a struggle practically in ancient times. Is that really all there was to it? It seems we are supposed to think so. Indeed, the subtitle of the Vasilia-based Vasilia book, Spies, is The Rise and Fall of the KGB in America. Operative word, fall. Over and out by the late 1940s, the conventional start date of the Cold War, 
The reason being the damage done to KGB networks in America by the defections of Whitaker Chambers, whom I talked about earlier, Elizabeth Bentley, Louis Budens, Igor Gusenko in Canada, others. Among other things though, this assumes there were no other still hidden networks operating, which these same defectors did believe existed. Senator Moynihan, who helped usher Venona into the public domain, underscored this message about the beginning of the Cold War being the end of the KGB and communism in America on different occasions. For example, he wrote, by the close of the 1940s, Communism was a defeated ideology in the United States with its influence in steep and steady decline and the KGB reduced to recruiting thieves as spies. In other words, case closed and what a relief. This messaging, this end of an era of finality has become a kind of consensus. This is part of the reason I think why people seem so confused about where everything from Obamacare to the Great Reset really comes from. And notice that this same messaging is the opposite of Whitaker Chambers belief that in the name of liberalism, the forces of the great socialist revolution, and I would say inside and outside intelligence channels, were securing their path to power at this same historical moment we are now supposed to look back on as the time when not only the KGB, but the socialist revolution overall was a spent force, which is ridiculous for so all sorts of reasons, including the ever expanding, ever socializing US government. I wanna bring in Herb Romerstein here. He was among a throng of experts at the Washington DC unveiling of the facility of notebooks at the Wilson Center in 2009. He said in, in a Q&A period, he was very impressed with them, but made it clear they had limitations. They were just a window on Soviet activities here because Vasiliev did not have access to so many things. For example, he didn't see any military intelligence files. He saw only one of the atomic files. And he saw none of the illegal or the files of the ace illegal spy master in the US, Akhmerov, who, according to Romerstein, sent back to Moscow 2,500 documents and photostats, a collection almost as big as what we've seen of Venona. Still, Romerstein believed the notebooks to be legitimate, and here's what he said. The positive thing about the notebooks is that they're totally consistent with Venona, they're consistent with the FBI materials in public domain and the investigations by the various congressional committees such as the House on American Activities Committee. In other words, this is me talking, they offered us no surprises. Now, given the source of Venona and Vasiliev's notebooks, can that be a coincidence? I'll leave that to you. As for me, I've come to regard this period in Cold War history, history, from Venona in 1995 to Vasily of Notebooks in 2009, incidentally, just around the time the Obama administration's Russian reset starring Hillary Clinton begins, which included the transfer, this right out of our headlines today, of hypersonic missile technology and US uranium deposits as a period designed to prevent too many surprises from leaking out in order to keep us from Bukovs a Bukovsky style reckoning with the deepest treachery and moral corruption on the part of our own leaders, many of whom were and are still living, and others who were driving the free world toward its hideous socialist future, now our hideous socialist present. That said, I wanna tell about one surprise from Venona, thanks to Herb Romerstein. The Venona Secrets is the name of the, uh, the book Romerstein co-authored with Eric Brindell, at one time, by the way, Senator Moynihan's aide, Brindell had died before the book's publication. The book contains what I consider to be the most important and unforeseen finding in all of Venona. This is the identification of the top advisor to FDR during World War II, a key architect of both our war making and post-war making policy, uh, planning as a Soviet agent. His name was Harry Hopkins. Given Romerstein's vast experience investigating and studying domestic communist subversion, his co-author M. Stanton Evans described him to me as the towering expert on these matters. Herb Romerstein was well qualified to make the judgment. I'll mention two of the essential pieces of information that led Romerstein to his conclusion. The first came in 1990 from Oleg Gordievsky, the extremely reliable Soviet intelligence officer who defected serving 10 years as a double agent working secretly for the British before he was exposed by Aldrich Ames, 
Gordievsky wrote that when he was a young intelligence officer in the 1960s, the great illegal spymaster Akhmerov lectured his class. Akhmerov mentioned Alger Hiss, but told the class that the most important of all Soviet wartime agents in the United States was Harry Hopkins. Akhmerov described contacts with Hopkins in the 1930s as well. This is very significant, especially as it comes from Akhmerov, who as an illegal worked and lived in the United States full time undercover. He had no, as an illegal, he had no visible or, or any other kind of connection with the Soviet, Soviet government here. He would not have broken his cover, Rummerstein reasoned, to have contact with a senior administration official unless that official was himself an agent. Since Akhmerov was Hopkins' co contact, Romerston believed Hopkins was a Soviet spy. There's much, much more to the Hopkins dossier, which I later added to my own book, American Betrayal. But let me add another piece of the evidence that Romerstein used in his original analysis. In 1998, a military historian named Edward Marr offered direct evidence of the Akhmerov-Hopkins relationship Mark wrote a paper arguing that it was probable virtually to the point of certainty that an agent called 19 in a May 1943 Venona cable signed by Akhmerov was Harry Hopkins. This was, this was big news. This was a big surprise. Hopkins was a highly controversial figure, but there was no talk of him having been a Soviet agent. And in fact, Mark did not believe he was a conscious agent but Romerstein did. This is where the debate was um, at the time I was doing my own research and tried to pull together more on the subject. But even what if he wasn't? The extent to which the conduct of World War II and the planning of the post-war peace was the product of both infiltrators and ideological collaborators, as Bukow Bukowski would have it, has never been reckoned with. Ideological communists up to junk our, com our constitutional rights, close in fellow travelers, controlled agents, agents of influence, convergence, um, convergence advocates, globalists. They created our world today. In the treacherous Hopkins, we see both ideological collaboration and likely infiltration at work and with disastrous consequences for life, liberty, and happiness all over the world. For example, there was a strong argument to be made that Harry Hopkins did much more to stand up the Soviet atomic bomb making program than the Dred Rosenbergs. This was a new world of borning. If Soviet agent Harry Hopkins at the White House was able to effectively run the war always for Soviet benefit, Soviet agent Alger Hiss at the State Department was busy fostering the creation of the United Nations, the basis of global governance. And indeed he would serve as its first acting secretary general, a Soviet agent. Meanwhile, Soviet agent Harry Dexter White, for example, over at the Treasury Department, was able to do a lot of things, including establishing the basis of the new global economy, the International Monetary Fund, of which he was the first leader. And there was so much more to this story, and doubtless more surprises, because as I mentioned earlier, the experts and defectors of the day believed there were other covert networks in Washington and elsewhere much like Bentley's and Chambers, only they were never exposed, along with so much else as Bukowski discovered. Chambers, I'm afraid, and later Bob Bukowski were correct about the trajectory of the great socialist revolution in the name of liberalism or progressivism, even compassionate conservatism, convergence, peace, Alinskyism, globalism, sustainability, etc. All of it moving away from constitutional form of government. Blinded by sand and dust and static from the infiltrators and ideological collaborators in our midst, we have never been able to see, or maybe really wanted to see, what it was that hit us. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Mrs. West. Uh, and we'll open it up to questions if anybody has any. I don't see any in the QA, Q and A. But if you guys want to type them up, oh, there's one right there. Oh, that's more of a comment. Brilliant. So well done. <laughs> Very <laughs> nice. Thank you. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions for Mrs. West, feel free to uh, take a couple seconds or so to put, th put those in the chat. If not, 
we can always uh, end it in just a bit as well. So I'll give you guys just a, just a minute there. Do you have any questions? Personally, no. Um, I'm still learning a bunch of things too. So I'm, I can't say that I am <laughs> well-versed in this uh -huh. topic, but it was very interesting to listen to. So I, well, I thank, thank you. you for, I know it's a lot time. of new material yes. uh, for most people. All right. Well, seeing that there are no questions in the in the chat right now, I want to thank you, Mrs. West, and everybody that joined us today virtually here on Zoom. Uh, if you are at all interested in attending any of our other upcoming lectures, making a gift to IWP, or applying to one of our graduate programs, uh, feel free to visit us at IWP. Oh, we okay, perfect. Thought there was questions. Didn't want to cut anybody off. Um. Real quick, Mrs. West. Uh, there's one question that says anything about Harry Hopkins? Anything else about Harry Hopkins? Yes, ma'am. Oh, well, there's quite a lot about Harry Hopkins. Um, I made him a study of in my book, American Betrayal, just because it was fascinating to learn. I was reading Herb Romerstein's analysis, you know, as a complete novice. I was looking at the uh, Venona page uh, cables and so on. I was coming to this quite fresh um, back around 2009, 10, 11, 12, when I was working on American Betrayal. And what, what I wanted to do in the book was to pull together a bigger dossier than these initial reports is, as these initial clues to his real identity. And so what I, what I was able to do was to go back look at the different records, look at the different accounts, read the different memoirs, and you start getting a picture of someone who essentially created a shadow government inside the Roosevelt administration. He was very powerful. He lived inside the White House living quarters, the family quarters with, the, with Mr. and Mrs. Roosevelt, President and Mrs. Roosevelt, uh, for much of the war years. And he was, when Winston Churchill came to Washington, for example, he was with Winston Churchill breakfast, lunch, and dinner along with the president. Um, his power was enormous. Reporters would say um, that when he was out of town, suddenly President Roosevelt had more to do because he did so much when he was in town. And what he was able to do through something called Len Lease, I don't know if you're familiar with Len Lease. Um, we've been talking a lot about it in terms of Ukraine, um, this sort of shipment, this open shipment of, of munitions and so on aid. Uh, the same thing went on in World War II and through Len Lease, Hopkins was actually able, and this was this is a case that has uh, been checked out and is gone through in great detail in, in American Betrayal. Um, he was actually able to ensure that the Soviets received what they needed to, come to uh, create an experimental atomic pile at the time of the Manhattan Project in the United States when the military had slapped an embargo, for example, on the export of uranium. And Hopkins was able to uh, go around that and uh, ensure, for example, that this embargoed, very precious ura uh, uranium was shipping over to the Soviet Union. And that's a fascinating story that um, was documented as early as the 50s and somehow forgotten along with Hopkins. So there's a huge dossier on him. I think one of the most damning facts about him though, which comes out in Venona and some of these other FBI, uh, it's actually an FBI release, which was that when the FBI first started to realize that the Soviets were penetrating our military industries to steal the atomic bomb secrets and other, other secrets, showing how important Hopkins was, J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, writes to Hopkins and tells him to inform the president as well. So he was that important. There would be the two people Hoover wanted you know, to hear about this. And he goes through chapter and verse about what the FBI has, has these early findings about what the FBI was learning about this Soviet penetration of our munitions uh, industry during the war. And what do you know, the first crack out of the bag, Hopkins goes where? To the Soviet embassy with this information. I mean, who does that? It, it's, this is something that comes out, I believe we, we have different corroborating information here from another file known as the Matrokin file. These were another 
KGB source that uh, that came out of uh, the Soviet Union in this roughly in that same time period I was talking about. So very strange, um, very strange character. And I think what Herb Romerstein was able to do was put together his understanding of how spy networks worked because he studied them his entire life. And he could make that assessment that because Hopkins had contact with this illegal, Akhmerov, the, the only people who would, would be other agents. And indeed, Akhmerov ran a lot of the big agents of the time for the Soviet Union. Thank you, Mrs. West. And there are actually a couple more questions that okay. just came in. Uh, so one is, do you think, uh, another one relating to Harry Hopkins, uh, do you think Harry Hopkins was the highest level Soviet mole in the U.S., or do you think there are other suspects for that? Um, he, you know, I think there are, it's hard to know who was the highest because I don't think we ever found out the identities of all of them. So, but he certainly, during the war years, he certainly was, I think you could say he was the most influential. Um, you know, he went instead of the Secretary of State, he went with Roosevelt to the wartime conferences where the end of the war and the early uh, planning for the uh, post-war period was conducted. He was sort of the opposite number of uh, the ministers of state from say, United Kingdom or Soviet Union, um, uh, China, the other countries. He was that person, not our Secretary of State at the time. So he was that important. So, um, but was he the highest? I, I can't answer because I don't know. We don't know. <laughs> Uh, another one is in uh, regards to, I think, the book that you wrote that you mentioned earlier on in the discussion. Uh, and one of our attendees was asking if there was, uh, you know, any highlights to the book or anything that they should look forward to uh, discover in your writings um, in that text. Well, um, I hope they take a look at the book. And if I know everyone has a lot of time fitting uh, extra reading in when you're in school, especially. But just flip through the um, flip through the index and see what interests you because I found it I found it the, the research was exhilarating to do because as I started it was almost as if I was peeling an onion I was all the things I had been taught in school one by one about World War II about the Cold War essentially uh, are flipped on their heads and. It, 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 it's a strange experience, but it was also extremely leading. And the book is sort of written in the form almost of a, um, sort of like a detective story in the sense that I, I structured it in terms of what discovery I made that led me to the next discovery that led to the next, that led to the next. And suddenly you see a whole new world appear uh, because it, it, I think it is very safe to say that um, what we have been told is one of these conventional wisdom uh, history told by the victors stories that we keep learning, people keep writing and repeating, no surprises. And it, it turns out not to be true. It turns out that much of what we've been told are lies and it's, it's enraging, but there's something um, I found uh, inspirational about trying to get back at the truth, trying to figure out who the truth tellers were, who've been maligned in our history that we're supposed to scorn, looking back, things like that. And it's, um, it's, I think, what history really should be. And, and if there are any historians in the making in, you, in the audience, you know, it, this is what you want to do. You want to go back to the primary sources and you want to flip the secondary sources. That's, that's where you want to go because that's how you test things. And that's how you see where we've been manipulated, where things have been politicized. And, if we're looking at you know, Bukowski's view of the world and the, and the intense socialization, socialist bent of our establishment, well, that's, that's what you're up against when you're trying to learn history. You're, you know, people talk about left-wing bias, liberal bias in media, academia. This is where it comes from. And so it's really left to us, kind of citizen journalists or citizen historians, to go back and check it out. What is true? What is fake? And it's... it's um, there's a lot there. There's a lot of new stuff to do. So it's kind of uh, a good place for young people because no, not everything has been done. Perfect, thank you. Uh, another one that we that came in was, uh, could you briefly discuss um, what is considered as right-wing convergence supporters? 
right-wing convergence supporters? Yes, ma'am. That's an interesting question. I would say all of our, um, all of our presidents participating in detente um, movements like that. I mean, that would that would be coming necessarily, you know, the arms control um, hierarchy, um, the multilateral internationalist bent. I mean, the convergence is not necessarily what they thought they were supporting, but I think that there was a, a great kind of undercurrent always pushing us into this international place. Um, I think that's why when Donald Trump arrived in 2016 with that agenda of America first, it was such an extraordinary shattering of the establishment moment, particularly on the right. So I think, I think that you know, the, the, the spectrum had shrunken quite a bit between right and left. And one thing I would say, um, there's a point at which uh, we can see really from Reagan, we can see the internationalist um, the internationalist uh, kind of consensus in the Republican Party, pro-immigration, um, uh, pro-free uh, trade. These, these things that we identify as conservative uh, that fit into this convergence model actually come out, again, out of that same book I was talking about towards Soviet America. When you have free trade, for example, you're breaking down national boundaries and the nation state is really the bulwark against socialist revolution. The nation state, this is again, a Trumpian concept that he reintroduced to American politics. Um, so it, it, it's almost as if there was really no demarcation from left to right in a lot of these um, places where we had achieved kind of this consensus on um, you know, free flow of people, immigration, free, you know, that kind of thing. And then this notion of America, I think the conservatives would want America at the head of an internationalist organization, a multilateral organization. I think that's how we conducted our policy, very Republican attitude, whereas maybe the left didn't really care where we were in terms of whether we headed it or not. So maybe that's, that's a demarcation that we could look at, but um, there was really nobody pushing back against convergence until we see this sort of America first notion take hold and a lot of people were quite electrified simply by the concept of having a border having trade at home you know looking out for american interests first as opposed to this morass of convergence and the last question we have uh to come in is to what extent was is the new wave of woke protest um or to what extent is the new wave of woke protest uh being manipulated by russians by Russians. Well, <clears throat> I, I don't have special knowledge, except I can go back a little in terms of uh, Russian involvement in, for example, environmentalism, trying to shut down American fracking. There, there have been investigations on the Hill that, that established that as a fact. Um, I, don't, I don't think that it's necessarily the Russians specifically behind a lot of these movements at this point there seems to be a melange and maybe they are at the very back of it, but it's it's hard to identify one actor. I think it's very hard. I think there's a lot of, um, there are quite a lot of cutouts in between. And I, I find it challenging to, to see where this is going. What, what I try to look at more than who's behind, you know, a woke protest, I try to see who is not supporting the, the, the woke, uh, global world economic forum, uh, great reset movement. And that I think is where you start seeing clarity, at least I do, for example, both sides in this war in Ukraine have signed on to so much of the digital currency, artificial intelligence, the transhumanism, the surveillance state, neither side in that conflict is actually standing up for liberty, sovereignty, getting the state off our back stopping the 24 seven surveillance state, et cetera. Both sides are deeply invested in it. And so that's kind of where I, I try to understand um, motivation and also uh, legitimacy of, of various, um, various controversies. So many of them I think are static that just try to get us arguing with each other and distract us from this ice cap, you know, inching across our nation into this form of servitude. So um, 
that's that's kind of a long answer. I hope that I hope that makes some sense. But I guess I'm saying look at the top and see what they're doing. Again, I was talking about that top-down revolution notion. And it isn't that Russia is is away from any of these these um these movements or the other side, the NATO side, the World Economic Forum side, the Soros side, the American side, they all share in essentially breaking the supply chain, stopping energy, um, stopping fertilizer. I mean, Europe is shutting down. You know, Europe's industry is shutting down as a result of, of this, this energy situation and, and so on, that neither side seems particular, no world leader seems particularly concerned about the fact that people, their people, in different countries are actually suffering and going to suffer much more. What world leader has expressed concern about this to a point of actually saying, I think we need a peace conference or we need to do something about this so that my people aren't putting clay pots together with candles under them to, to shield against a North Sea winter. I mean, this is, this is where I think you see the synergy and maybe not just, not just Russia or not just, you know, just, do you see what I'm saying? It's there's they're all in league, um, and it's uh, it's something we need to pay more attention to. Because I think people get confused and think there's one side versus another, and we have to pick one. I, I personally don't think we have to pick one, but look at what they're doing to us, all of us. Thank you, Mrs. West, and thank you for everybody that uh, put a question in the Q and A. We greatly appreciate yes, it. Thank you very uh, much. Yes. And so thank you again uh, to everybody who joined us today virtually uh, via Zoom. Uh, again, if you are interested in attending any of our other upcoming lectures, both in person and virtual, uh, making a gift to IWP or applying to one of our several graduate programs, please visit us at iwp.edu. Thank you again for everybody for joining. And thank you again, Mrs. West, for a wonderful talk. Oh, thank you so much. I greatly appreciated the opportunity. Everybody have a great rest of your day.